now, which usually is an awkward thing because I haven't even started talking yet, so you don't even know who I am. But uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer while we're waiting for other people to join. Polite Coloradoans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from New York. That we, people would be fighting over questions. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also why I moved to Colorado. So, yeah. I'm sure your presentation will drum up some. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I will go ahead and just say the introduction and then turn it over to you. Sure. Um, welcome, everyone, to our second West Slope Startup Week, which is now a month. We have over 70 sessions, all crafted by people in Colorado and along the Western Slope. So that'll be going every Tuesday and Thursday in July. Um, it was created with the intention to bring people together in Colorado and entrepreneurs, um, give people a place to connect on ideas. And this year, since we're going virtual, we do encourage everyone to move over to Slack and maybe have conversations there. I will put the link in the chat for you all. Um, just some reminders, we are encouraging everyone to turn on their camera and have mute on as well, uh, just in case there's any background noise, but if you guys do want to have a question, that's fine to turn it on. Um, and we would like to thank our sponsors, our title sponsor, U.S. Bank, for making this, ha um, <laughs> making this possible. Um, just a reminder that we are recording all our sessions and they should be posted on Sketch within one to two days of the actual sessions. So you can always go back and catch up on a session you miss. So with that, welcome to There's Never Been a Better Time to Build a Digital Product. Here's how to get started with Jonathan Greenchan. Oh, Greenchan, we went over. It's okay. <laughs> I'm half Chinese I'm and half Irish, so okay. usually I tell people just start with Green Chan and then we can go from there. Yeah, so. Okay, I will turn it over to him. Uh, all right, hey everybody. So uh, let me see here. I'm going to spotlight my video, if you don't mind, Angelica. And uh, what I'm also going to do here is just uh, share my screen. Let me just get this started. All right, share screen. Share, slideshow, presenter view. All right, you guys see my uh, full screen, right? Sweet, okay. So uh, my name is John the Grecian. I'm a co-founder of the Founder Institute. And what I wanna do here today is that I'm gonna do a presentation. All right, um, but Angelica and I were talking beforehand that uh, I am gonna stop a couple of times during the presentation because it's, it's sort of long. I'm gonna keep it to about 25 minutes or so. But uh, I'm gonna stop a couple of times during the presentation to get your questions. So if you have any questions, throw them in, in the chat um, and, uh, and we can address them sort of during the presentation itself. But then afterwards, I wanna go through a Q&A. Uh, if you have uh, ideas for digital products that you want to share. I'm more than happy to, to give feedback on those. And I really want the, the majority of this event to be, to be uh, you know, feedback. So um, FI is the world's largest pre-seed startup accelerator. Uh, we are based in Silicon Valley. I, I, the first four years of building this business, I was actually based out in Aspen. I left Aspen and moved out to, to Silicon Valley uh, with my business partner out there for the last, uh, or for about five years or so. And then about a year ago, I moved back to Colorado and, and I'm currently living in Basalt. Uh, but in that time, we've expanded the Founder Institute to 75 countries, 190 cities. Our alumni have raised over $950 million uh, and they're building a ton of really cool companies. So. When I say a pre-seed startup accelerator, what that means is that we work with entrepreneurs and founders at a stage before they're ready to raise seed funding. So usually that means uh, somebody who's before they've reached uh, quote unquote traction uh, or any kind of uh, level of angel funding. And, and that's what we do at FI. And we did just open up our Denver program, which because of COVID is going to be virtual. You can learn more about that at, at uh, fi.co slash apply slash Denver. But um, we are 11 years old now, and we were started in 2009. Actually, we were started in April of 2009. So if you look at this chart, we were basically started right at the bottom, right? 
Uh, and in some ways, what, what we're dealing with right now uh, as an economy and as, as the world is, is similar to that. Okay. Um, and just to be clear, I'm going to talk a lot today about, you know, the optimistic parts of what we're going through, right? Obviously, a lot of people are losing their jobs. Um, people are losing their lives. Uh, but um, if you do have a, a um, you know, a comfortable financial cushion, this really is a good time uh, to build a business. Um, there is a reason why and this is one of the largest conferences and it's out in San Francisco called TechCrunch Disrupt. It's called, uh, it, the reason why it's called that is because entrepreneurs thrive in disruption, okay? Big companies, they thrive when things are steady and secure and they can plan and they can build and they can invest in R&D and all of this stuff, right? But when the, the playing field is shifting constantly, when consumers have new problems that they didn't have before, right now, all of us have new problems that we didn't have a couple of months ago, right? And problems that we had a couple of, couple of months ago, pre-COVID, pre-social unrest here in the United States, um, you know, th those those problems are, are totally different now. And the big companies are never going to be fast enough to address those problems. And that's why entrepreneurs always thrive during times like this. Um, really, the odds have shifted in your favor. And this is one of the reasons why FI was started back in 2009 during the, the middle of the financial crisis was, you know, we, we started off by throwing a ton of huge like startup conferences and people were giving us the space for free. Right, people were willing to promote our event for free and free advertising and all this stuff if we just like gave them a shout out on stage. Like, there's when when economic times are tough, the cost of business goes um, becomes very low because people are willing to sort of barter. Right, it's just like, hey, yeah, I, I can't pay you this for your advertising, but hey, I'm bringing like a thousand people here, so I'm going to talk about you at the event, and they're like, yeah, that's cool. Right. And same thing with um, all the venues that we got, like the cost of business is doing low. If we tried to run one of those conferences in Silicon Valley, like, uh, you know, pre COVID. So even in, in January or February of this year, it would, it would have been like a hundred thousand dollars out of pocket, which was never going to happen. Right. Instead it was like a thousand dollars out of pocket. And those are the types of opportunities that people have during financial downturns like this. The other huge opportunity is the availability of talent is high. All right. I would venture to guess that there are people watching this today that have been laid off and a lot of um, like really good people have been laid off. They haven't been laid off because of, you know, that they suck at their job. They've been laid off just because of, of what's going on in the world today. So uh, startups in general, especially tech and digital startups have a great opportunity to bring in people that honestly they have no business having access to. All right. A lot of people from from, you know, really big companies and especially now in COVID because people can work remotely like there's this huge talent base that's available out there. And a lot of them want to work on things that they're passionate about. Right. So these this is a huge talent force that typically would not be available uh, except for a time like this. So and, you know, FI was started in 2009 and a lot of other companies were started at that time as well. If you start looking at this list, these were the companies that essentially defined tech, most of them digital companies that defined tech over the last 10 years, the, the last decade, um, you know, and a lot of them probably aren't too surprising, right? Usually the circumstances of the time create unique opportunities for these companies to be built. So Airbnb, uh, back, what was happening back in, in 2008 to 2011? People's, the value of their home significantly dropped. Okay, if you can't get a refinance, if you can't do all this stuff, all right, maybe start renting out some rooms in your home, right? Um, the gig economy, things like Uber, people were, were losing their jobs and giving them more opportunities to make revenue. Dollar Shave Club, Warby Parker, Untuck It, there were a ton of uh, direct-to-consumer brands because all of the, um, you know, sort of the brick-and-mortar uh, you know, retail shops were really, really struggling. Um, you know, a lot of blockchain stuff came into play because people were losing a lot of faith in the global financial system. And um, a lot of, you know, more fintech came into play as a result of that. Same with Square and Venmo. Anyway, basically, uh, companies are, that defined the, the next decade in tech are going to be built right now or, or the ones that are uh, getting their initial their initial uh, traction right now. And this happens as well. You can go back and, and 
do a Google search and find the companies that started uh, around the dot-com boom or the dot-com bust, I should say, uh, around the year 2000, and you're going to see a lot of amazing companies as well. And uh, this is a normal thing that happens. So, you know, even though when the economy is down, basically that's the time to build, right? And these are just some of the, the more popular quotes that I've seen. I mean, you know, we can go a little old school here with Winston Churchill and Warren Buffett, but uh, Phil Levin, who's a, a, the founder of Evernote, founder and former CEO of Evernote, uh, this is Naval Ravikant, who runs a, a company called Angelist. You know, th this is the time uh, to, build a, to build a great business. So with that being said, um, let's talk about how to get started. And first, you got to know your playing field. So for any um, Mr. Robot fans out there, uh, I'm going to define our playing field as, uh, as evil corp, right? So essentially, your playing field, and it could be big company, it could be an evil corporation, it could be a nice corporation, whatever. Okay, it's a company that has resources that you don't have. Usually you're going up against either as a direct competitor or a substitute indirect competitor, whatever. And these companies are always going to have a ridiculous number of advantages against startups, right? They get the best talent. They have all this money to buy the best people. They have these marketing campaigns to shove products down people's throats. But startups will always have two advantages. And uh, the first advantage will break down to something like this, right? For anyone that's worked in a big company, this shouldn't come as much of a surprise. Uh, the first startup that I did back in, uh, we were acquired in 2007 by Real Networks. I'm probably dating myself here, but if you know what Real Networks is, you, you're probably dating yourself as well. We were bought by Real Networks. I came from an environment where we could move quickly. All of a sudden, I needed to go through seven layers of bureaucracy to, uh, to get anything done. And no matter how much the most innovative big companies try to figure this out, they haven't yet, all right? So at a big company, they cannot move fast. They're learning, it, it's all in any business, um, consumer trends change over time. So it's all about how fast you can learn to build a digital product that serves those trends and their needs over time, right? So a big company, um, for them to release a new product, test it, get feedback, and then release another one, test to get feedback, it's gonna be a very slow process. So their learning curve is, is gonna be very like slow and steady, right? They're gonna learn, they're going to improve, but it's gonna be slow and steady because of all this bureaucracy. Now, a startup doesn't have the bureaucracy. And if you're a startup that has a bureaucracy, then you're really screwed, okay? Um, but uh, a startup or anybody trying to start, um, you know, even as just one person on their computer trying to start a digital product, you have no bureaucracy. So your um, advantage here is that you can have sort of an exponential learning curve, right? It's sort of like the rule of somebody said, um, what is it, that compounding interest is like the greatest invention of all time, right? Like you can have a compounded learning curve where um, you can move so much faster than they, than they can. And that's an advantage that they cannot take away from you. Um, secondly, you have the advantage of going niche, okay? So a big company, has shareholders, they have a fiduciary responsibility. And honestly, this even applies not even so much with like big lumbering companies, even any VC company, like they have, uh, you know, venture capitalists that own a large portion of their company. So they need to work on projects that can have a big impact on the business, right? They can't work on a project that's gonna give you like one or 2% or be for a small portion of their user base. Uh, they need to have a big impact. So any project that they put resources and time towards, which is gonna take a long time because again, they're slow, um, is going to be something that, that casts a very wide net. And um, usually when you do that, you're trying to solve a problem for a lot of people. And that equates to products that are great for a lot of people, but perfect for absolutely nobody, okay? Uh, if anybody has used anything from Salesforce, for example, this is like a classic case of this, like Salesforce is a crap product. Okay, I'm sorry, but it is. Uh, but they uh, have the marketing resources to shove this down people's throats, even though literally nobody will use Salesforce. There's not one person in the world who will use Salesforce and be like, Oh, my God, this is amazing. This is exactly what I needed it to do. Right? They have to build products that can serve a ton of people. And whenever you do that, that means you're not going to serve individual people very well. Startups don't have that problem, okay? You can go super, super 
niche. And this is what the, almost all the successful companies you'll see today, this is what they do. They start super, super niche. And then um, they serve a, so, a small audience with a perfect feature. And then um, the, the customers are so delighted by that that then they share it with their friends and then you get all these marketing benefits and then you can grow exponentially from there by building a community. All right, so those are the only two advantages, honestly, the only two advantages that you have as a startup is your ability to be faster and your ability to serve a smaller target audience better. And there's one mistake that you can make that negates these two advantages and that's a lack of focus, okay? Uh, if you're not focused, you're not going to be learning fast enough because you're going to be sort of overextending yourself, doing way too many things. So you're not going to be learning. Um, so you're essentially going to, you know, you're quitting, creating the equivalent of like layers of bureaucracy because you're not going to keep up that compounded learning curve. And secondly, if you're trying to cast too wide of a net, um, you're competing on the same playing field as big companies that have marketing budgets to, to push, you know, suboptimal products down people's throats. Uh, so, you know, I don't know, Sun Tzu, right, or I, I believe uh, said that, uh, you know, most battles are, are lost before they're even started. And, and if you go in without this level of focus and without, um, you know, the ability to move quickly, then you've lost before, before you've even begun. So in summary, as a startup, being unfocused is worse than being wrong. It's like 10 times worse, 100 times worse than being wrong. Okay, being wrong is fine because nobody knows what they're doing with the startup, to be honest with you. Um, you have to try a lot of things and learn. And if you're unfocused as you're trying too many things at one time, you're not learning anything, which is terrible. Okay, what that will equate to is you essentially becoming a, what is known as like a zombie startup where it's like you're the living dead, like you're on a path to dying, you just don't know it yet. All right, it's much better to be super focused and incredibly wrong than to be very unfocused and a little bit wrong in all these places and not learn anything. So I do realize that being focused is a pretty, sorry, I have allergies here. Being um, focused is sort of a nebulous term. So let me, let me explain exactly what, what being focused is. As a startup and as any, even if you're again, a solo founder who just wants to go out and build the digital product, um, to be focused, you have to fulfill these five things. Because a lot of people will say, oh yeah, we're super focused. But if you're not doing this, then you're not focused. You have to solve one problem for one customer with one product, one killer feature, and one revenue stream. So before I, before I get into, uh, into this part, uh, I do want to open up. Does anybody have any... Um, any questions thus far? Uh, this is Ryan Anderson. Um, you mentioned um, a, a conference at the beginning in Silicon Valley, um, TechCrunch Disrupt, I think it was. Can you tell, tell, just shed some more light on that conference? Oh, well, yeah, okay. So I, I was just saying that uh, the, one of the biggest startup conferences in the world is called TechCrunch Disrupt, and it's called TechCrunch Disrupt because that's that's where startups can be successful. Um, is is in a state of disruption, essentially, right? And this is, is that why, the, is that the name of the conference? Yes, TechCrunch Disrupt. Okay, thanks. That was it for me. Now, the conference that that we were running a Founder Institute that helped us get started, that. Uh, that was sort of the kind of thing that, I mean, we left the conference business a long time ago, again, because it got too expensive, right? Back in 2008, 2009, it was very easy because the prices of everything was low. Uh, we were running a conference called the Founder Showcase. And again, we were, we had basically like zero costs for these conferences. We, we had, uh, Elon Musk was a keynote speaker for one of our conferences. And these are all things that we were able to do only because of the economic conditions at the time. Any other questions quickly before I get into the, uh, the second part here? And, and as I said before, at the end of the presentation, I'd, I'd love to, again, just get more questions, but also I'd, I'd love to hear some people's ideas um, and, and give feedback. Anyone else want to jump in?
All right. Well, that being said, I will go back and uh, share my screen and we'll get going on the, the focus aspect of it. And all right, so here we are. Um, Angelica, you can see this properly, right? Yes, it looks good. Cool, all right. So as an early stage startup, you have to solve um, one problem uh, for one customer with one product, one killer feature and one revenue stream. So the first thing that I wanna mention here is, and, and this is just the way that most people's minds think when they wanna start thinking about and, and just ideating on a digital product. They, they try to think of things that are like cool and nifty and futuristic and stuff like that. Uh, but honestly, at the end of the day, people don't buy products, they buy solutions to problems, okay? You have to start with a problem. And this is one of the biggest traps that we see startups have in the early stages, is that they, they have this idea for a product and they just start building it and adding all these features and all this stuff. And we look at it and we're just like, what problem are you solving exactly? right? Because there's a million different products around the world. And just think about yourself as a consumer. When, when a product really resonates with you, it's because it's solving a problem that you have, right? It's not because it's nifty or cool or anything like that. So, uh, and that's why we have uh, picnic pants here, which clearly is not really solving any kind of problem. So you have to identify a, a very specific problem. That problem needs to affect a lot of people and that problem needs to be important enough to somebody that they will pay to solve it. All right. That is basically the litmus test that you need to have when you're thinking about the digital product that you want to build. All right. It has to be a problem that is important enough to them that they will pay to solve it. All right. If one good thing is going to come out of COVID, I think it's because a lot of these, I don't know, that I'm, I'm, constantly head up on Instagram for like designer sock companies and things like that. Like those companies are going to go by the wayside. You know why? Because nobody wakes up in the morning thinking, Oh wow, I really, really need a designer pair of socks. All right. Um, you know, you want to solve problems that people uh, value and, and that are important to them. So secondly, not only do you need to find a very specific problem, uh, obviously you need to find a very specific customer that has that problem. And your customer is the exact person that pays for your product, okay? This is very uh, commonly, it's a, it's a common mistake where people have what we call customer confusion. Um, they'll say, okay, well, I'm building a marketplace for this and this, and they're focused on, not on the people that are paying, okay? If you have a marketplace and you, let's say you're selling, and we'll use a Colorado example here, let's say that you're selling used skis, it's a, it's a marketplace for people to sell used skis. I'm not saying that's a good idea, but just use that as an example. Your customer is not the people selling the used skis. Your customer is the people who pay, the people who are buying the used skis. Because if you can get those people, if you can build a whole community of people who are buying skis, it will be very easy to get the people to sell it to them, right? So your, your customer in any business is the person who pays you to, uh, to, for the product and in some cases, and, and the most common example here is like products for children or, or uh, even uh, if you're working at a big company or something, um, you know, it's the people that directly influence the purchase of the product, right? So obviously a child's not gonna buy the product, their parent's gonna buy it, but the child's gonna influence it. Same if like a lower level employee maybe doesn't have the authorization to purchase a, a B2B product, but, uh, but they can influence that purchase decision. So you really have to also be specific. If you don't understand your customer well enough, you're not going to understand the problem. Um, don't ever go in with the conception that, okay, yeah, I'm going to sell my product to women, right? That's like half the plan. Uh, similar speaking, when you are looking to build a B2B product and let's say you're selling HR software, uh, don't say, yo, yeah, I'm selling HR software to medium-sized companies. Like, no, you, you don't sell a company, right? It's, it's not like a person. You, you always sell to a person. So you have to understand who that person is. So if let's say you're trying to sell an HR software to a medium-sized business, your customer is not the medium-sized business. Your customer is actually that maybe it's the middle manager in the business, 
right? That customer has uh, their own KPIs that they're trying to hit to get a raise in their role. They have their own challenges and their own needs and, and, and all of that stuff, right? So you have to understand exactly who makes the decision to buy your product. Um, otherwise, how, how could you ever even come close to building the right product for them? And um, you have to start niche, okay? So as I said before, starting niche is incredibly important uh, because if you don't do that, then you're competing against all of the big company uh, uh, marketing budgets. But every company that you look at that's big started niche, right? Amazon started with books. Facebook started in one dorm. Uh, like, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on. Everybody always starts small and then they build organically from there. It's, you know, I, I see it all the time where startups try to come right out of the bat, like right out of the gate, trying to, you know, compete at a, at a very high level and trying to say, oh yeah, this is like, who's your target audience? Or like anybody, I'm like, no, you're going to fail, right? You have to create pockets of customers. Um, you have to create a community so that uh, they can lower your cost of acquiring new customers through word of mouth, through referrals and things like that. So um, every smart company has started very, very niche and then expanded from there. So when I tell you to start niche and start small, that doesn't, I'm not trying to say, Hey, like curb your, uh, curb your aspirations or anything like that. Right? Like you can still get super big. Like these companies are two of the biggest companies in the world, but you would just have to start very small. That's always how these companies start. Okay, so the third thing here, uh, after you've solved one problem for one customer, now you need to solve it with the product. And one of the most common mistakes that I see is people come in with uh, a lot of these phrases, okay? I'm gonna create a family of products, a suite of products, a lifestyle brand, a brand of products, and you know, there's a lot of different variations of this. If you ever hear any of these things coming out of your mouth, just stop. All right, because it is, um, it's hard enough to create one product that solves one problem for one customer. Uh, don't try to do multiple at a time. And as you want to start building this product, uh, this is super important, okay? Do not build the product until you have validated the customer demand. I've seen way too many people um, waste money hiring you know, offshore developers to build you know, products that essentially, even if they're super, uh, super successful are, are going to become throwaway products anyway, and they're going to have to rebuild the whole business. Um, you know, you really should not worry about that kind of stuff in the beginning. When you're talking about digital products, you do not, the, the first thing you do is not build. Okay. So if you're not a developer, uh, if you're not a programmer, that this is not things you need to worry about in the very early stages. Um, those will be good problems to have. The way you should look at technology uh, when you're starting to build a digital product is that's a way to automate things, automate processes that you have proven um, are important, okay? Because way too many people build all of these platforms, spend all this money building a product, building um, something to do all of these processes, and then no customers want it at all. And they've just literally flushed all of their money down the toilet. So. This is something that we very much preach at Founder Institute and, and we have portfolio companies that have generated uh, a large amount of revenue. So, um, well, 30,000 plus mailing lists, uh, 10,000 MRR, MRR means a monthly recurring revenue. They've done all of these different things literally without uh, writing a single line of code. Now, look, obviously after that, um, you know, these are a means to get to an end. So you can do a lot of these things, which then can allow you to recruit the right people. It can allow you to raise angel funding. Um, it can allow you to do different things to bring the company to the next level. But in the beginning, you know, you want to do these things that, that don't scale, which is one of the terms for it. Um, and you really just want to validate the business before you go out and start investing all of this time and money into actually building it. So one of the companies that I think does it or did it really well, and this is what's known as the concierge MVP. Um, and MVP is a minimum viable product. So it's basically the first product that you're going to put out um, is a company called zero cater. And what they did, this was a company that essentially uh, like, office managers at small, medium-sized businesses would use to get lunch uh, for their employees, right? And it was started by uh, somebody who was an early employee at a startup in Silicon Valley. 
And because he was an early employee, he was in charge of getting lunch for everybody. So he started seeing this problem. He started creating a spreadsheet to track all the different restaurants and stuff. And he started understanding, okay, not only do I have to do it under a budget, but I need variation because people start getting mad if I just am getting, you know, Indian food every day or whatever. Uh, he actually operated this business for 18 months, um, quit his job, uh, was making a good amount of revenue and raised $1.5 million literally by doing it in a spreadsheet. Okay. He had um, a landing page and this landing page right here is anything that you can build using, you know, paying a $10 a month subscription with no code um, on a, I don't know what he used back then. I'm not sure if, uh, if Squarespace was back, was, was around back then, but he probably used uh, WordPress or something like that. There's a lot of tools and he literally would just get, people would fill out a form about, okay, dietary restrictions, location, type of how many people, all this kind of stuff. And he would track in a spreadsheet saying, okay, all right, I have all of these businesses and I have all these restaurants. So then he started working with the restaurants and saying, hey, if I bring you new businesses, will you cut me a really big discount? And then he took a portion of that discount and voila, now he's got a profitable business, right? He literally was just doing this through a spreadsheet. The office managers that are using the website, they, they don't know that he's like a hamster on a hamster wheel doing it in the background. They think that there's this amazing AI that's, that's doing this business for them, right? And he was able to do that. And again, obviously that's not a sustainable business, but he's able to do that in a way uh, that starts generating revenue where now he can recruit people and raise funding to actually build the proper technology to push the business forward. Right. And, and me, I'm, I'm, I have a large background in product management. The thing that I loved most about this is not only was he doing all of that and generating that revenue, he essentially was building the spec for the technology that was needed. Right. Because he was doing it all manually. So he knew exactly the tech that he needed to build when he was able to build it because he was doing it all manually like a hamster on a hamster wheel on his own. <clears throat> So the second method you can do it uh, without building and spending a lot of money, and I'm going to use a, an example here of Sprig. So Sprig was founded uh, by a, a guy named Gagan Biani. He uh, is also, he's an alumni of Founder Institute. Before he did Sprig, he started a company called Udemy, uh, which, which some of you may know. But Sprig was a, a company that wanted to deliver food to you uh, within 15 minutes in San Francisco. Okay, so instead of trying to go out and start a kitchen and build all this AI, this predictive thing and tracking and all this kind of stuff, he and he literally just found some people on Craigslist, found some chefs, found some drivers for a weekend. He used Eventbrite as his, you know, kind of e-commerce solution so people could order uh, Eventbrite and, you know, Eventbrite's for selling tickets to events, but instead of like a VIP ticket and a general admission or whatever, he would have, okay, do you want the chicken meal or do you want the veggie meal or do you want the Indian meal or whatever? Uh, so he cobbled together all this stuff and he, they were literally in an apartment in San Francisco on a settlers of Catan board, uh, managing out uh, how all of their drivers were going around the city to make sure that people got their food in 15 minutes. Okay. Literally zero code to validate and prove out this model. He ended up raising about 70, 70, so 60, something like that million dollars from top VCs and angels. Now the company did go bust, um, but almost every food delivery company went bust in San Francisco. Uh, but I just, it's a super interesting way that he got it started. And this is somebody that built a $2 billion business, right? So even he knew that to get it started, you really just have to start super, super simple um, and then scale it out from there. And then uh, a corollary to this is the no-code MVP. So I listed some, some uh, resources on here. These are all solutions that people can use to start building digital products without any code, all right? Some of them are free, some of them are paid. Even the ones that are paid are gonna have pretty, pretty liberal, like free plans so you can play around with them and, and really see if it's what you want. And even when they are paid, honestly, they're not gonna be very expensive, okay? But let's say you wanted to build like I said before, this idea, which again, I don't think is good, but if you wanted to build a marketplace for used skis, you could use a, a, a site or a service like a share tribe or a Creasolid to, to get that up. Literally, you could have it up in a day or two, right? Zero code. Uh, so there's a ton of resources out there. Um, and I recommend you look at something like nocode.tech, even if you just Googled like no code solution for X, 
and X being like uh, the, the type of business that you wanted to run, like let's say you wanted to build something like an Airbnb, like Google no code solution for Airbnb, like you're probably gonna start getting some results of, of different resources that may be helpful for you if that's the kind of business that you wanna run, all right? So there is a, a huge, huge movement around this no code stuff. And uh, again, it, you can get started right away and start validating these things before you know, maybe you quit your job or before you start sinking a lot of money into uh, a tech solution, building a product that you're not sure anybody's even gonna want. So uh, the last method that you can do is, is to build an audience. And this is something I really am a proponent of, especially for consumer products. All right, so let's say that you wanna build like an app for runners or something. Um, the hardest part about building that app, you can have the best programmers in the world, the best technology, all the stuff. The hardest challenge that you're gonna have in that app is getting customers, okay? It's, it's user acquisition. So start a meetup group for runners in your city. Then start to get other people in other cities to become leaders of that meetup group. Start building an audience first. That gives you two distinct advantages. Number one, you have an audience of people to tell you what they want so they can help you decide on how to build the product. And number, number two, you have um, people to give you honest feedback when you start to come up with some of these first versions. And number three, when you finally do have a, a good version of the product, you have your initial customer list. All right, same goes for uh, Facebook groups, same goes like MailChimp is where, again, you could create a, uh, a newsletter or a blog type community, uh, podcasting, webinars. There's a lot of different ways that you can start to build the community first before you build the product. Because believe me, one of the biggest misconceptions that I see with founders building consumer products is that they think that the best product wins. So they focus all of their time on building an amazing product. And I hate to say it, but the, the best product does not always win. Okay, that's why sales forces and, and a lot of these businesses are, are around. It's because they have the marketing budgets to drown everybody out, else out, right? Um, so again, user acquisition for any consumer startup is gonna be your biggest uh, concern. So if that's the case, you might as well start building the community first and, and see if it's even worth it. Okay, so uh, last two here, and I'm gonna go quickly through these and then I, I'll get to some of your questions. So. You need to have one killer feature on your product. Don't try to uh, add and add and add and add and add features, all right? Because again, simplicity wins here. It's a very common misconception that consumers want choice. And this is a screenshot from like Dell website or something. And each of these drop downs have like 10 different options. So I don't know what the permutation is here, but there's a ridiculous number of options on this page, right? Consumers want freedom of choice. Here's Apple, okay. You want number one, number two, or number three, right? This is what consumers want. Choice can, can stress people out. People want freedom from choice. When they think about a problem that they have in the morning, like, like what you know, hopefully is a problem that you're trying to solve, they're not thinking, oh, I needed to do this, 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 and this. It's literally just like, I just need something to do this, right? And that is what you need to focus on figuring out is, is that one thing. Adding other features, having 10 features that are like a, a, a six on a scale of 10 versus having uh, you know, one that's a nine, like I'll take the one out of nine like a million times, right? That is the, you have to find the, the, the solo features that are important, especially for new products to get out of the, the gate. Um, and the best thing is, again, if you can find that problem, if you can solve that one feature, the customers will tell you what the next features they want are. It takes the whole guessing game out of your product roadmap, right? You don't have to start projecting about what they want. They'll, they'll love you so much for it that they'll tell you what to add to your product. All right, and then finally, you need to have a revenue stream, okay? The most common thing that people will say is they'll bring up a Twitter or a Google or something like that and say, oh, well, they started with no revenue stream. Yes, that's true, but um, you know, Brad Duke also won $220 million, right? Uh, it's, you're basically, if you start without having a revenue stream um, and without having any plan to get a revenue stream, you're, you're basically just, just trying to cash in a lottery ticket, all right? Yeah, it does happen. That doesn't mean it's a good strategy. Now, and let me be clear here. Uh, for a lot of the, early, the earliest stage products, first versions, yeah, you're not gonna have a revenue stream, okay? 
but you need to have a very clear revenue stream in mind when you start getting into a business because it just may not be a good business because there's no revenue stream. All right. That's the case for a lot of, of businesses. There's a lot of great products that are not built because there's no way to make money off them. Um, and what I will also say is that don't go in thinking that advertising is going to be your revenue stream. If you think that advertising is going to be your revenue stream, then you're aiming, then you're basically saying, okay, I'm going to be one of these companies. Okay. Because at a $5 CPM, which is a, a decent, you know, it's obviously I'm rounding here, but $5 is a cost per thousand generally uh, for advertising. Do the math. That means that you need to generate a million views to make $5,000. Okay. That's a lot of people and not a lot of money because you got to pay people, you got taxes, you got uh, infrastructure costs, host, hosting, all this stuff, right? So yeah. just know that if you think that advertising is going to be your revenue stream, then there's only one way you can go, and that is to shoot for the moon and to bank on the fact that you're going to be driving tens, hundreds of millions of users to your site per month. And um, don't get clever with revenue streams. A lot of people try to be like innovative with revenue streams and get creative and try to say, okay, I'm going to do this for this person and then this for that person. And then they're going to work together and then I'm going to get a percentage. And, you know, this is not a place where you want to be like this dude from the hangover and, and try to try to get super creative. Okay. There's a lot of other places to be creative. You should put your creativity towards uh, the execution of your business, not towards the revenue model. The best revenue models are simple. Okay. The best revenue model is you give me a product, I give you money. Uh, and the extension of that is, is that we continue to do that and we agree to continue doing that on a monthly basis, which is essentially a subscription, right? That's the best revenue model. And that's the, the type of revenue model that you should strive for, especially in the early stages of your business. Okay, so in summary, you gotta solve one problem for one customer, one product, one killer uh, feature and one revenue stream. And um, I like to sum it all up by just saying, as a startup, it's just, it's all about prioritization, okay? That's all it is, because you have a limited amount of resources, and every minute spent on A that's not spent on B, um, when A is a waste of time, means that, you know, you're, you're essentially your runway of time before you run out of money and have to quit the company uh, is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So, um, you know, this framework here is supposed to help you, uh, you know, properly figure out that, uh, that prioritization so that, uh, that you don't run out of money. Okay. Um, thanks everyone. And as I said, we are, um, we are enrolling in, uh, in Founder Institute Denver and you can learn more about that at fi.co slash apply slash Denver. Uh, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Cool. So I do have, let me bring up here a, uh, I have a little worksheet. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Anyone have any questions while I'm bringing up this worksheet to get feedback on, uh, or to give feedback on ideas? Don't be shy guys. Usually what happens is, uh, is there's, one or two people, and thank you before Ryan Anders with the cute dog for asking the question. Um, usually uh, a couple of people ask questions and then it starts to kind of snowball from there. So who wants to, uh, who wants to ask a question? Anybody? Yeah, I do. My name is Brenna. Um, hey. Hi. <laughs> thank you for giving this talk, by the way. It was really helpful. Um, I'm working on a multi-sided platform where one side is B2B and the other side would be B2C. Um, and I feel like they're, I don't know, be, be more be, be more specific. So what, what, it, who, what is the platform? Like what are, what's the marketplace for? Um, the marketplace is outdoor enthusiasts, um, initially in Colorado. And the other side of that would be um, nature professionals. So land managers, wildlife managers. Um, so are they paying nothing. those professionals for experiences? Sorry, say that again? Are they paying them, like who's paying who and for what? So the nature professionals would be paying for um, access to connect with the public that's using their lands. 
and or for the data that the public produces based off their use of the public lands. Um, and then the consumers would be paying for information related to the nature in those public lands. I would not, you, you need to go in with one customer, right? To try to do them both at the same time is not going to work. My guess is, is that nature professionals are, are not generally speaking going to have a lot of ex expendable income. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I also think that at least right now, and especially, I mean, we're all Coloradans, right? The amount of people that are out camping every weekend and using fires that shouldn't be and all these out of plate, out of state for license plates that I'm seeing uh, because of COVID and even just because of millennials, the, the people getting outdoors, the van life movement, all this kind of stuff is these are all trends that are, are really, really cresting like a wave right now. So I would definitely um, focus on, you know, the, the people um, actually paying and getting something from the nature professionals first. All right. Um, okay. You want to start with one transaction. Uh, and if you can enable that transaction, then you can start to add other stuff after that, right? The first thing that you do is, is definitely not going to be the vision that you have. If you try to fulfill that vision in one step, you're going to fail. Uh, you know, you need to look at that as a series of steps. Okay, that's helpful. <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, does anyone else have questions? I had a question. Hey. Um, Hi, so we do um, business to business services, so virtual assistants and that kind of a thing, um, website support, e-commerce support, that type of a thing. So our original um, uh, solve one problem, right, taking things off people's plates, giving them more time um, for one customer. And originally we had kind of focused on small business and then realized that they not all of them, but typically they can have um, unsteady streams of revenue. And so they weren't able to uh, continuously pay for the services, even though they desperately need them. Right. And I guess my question just is, how do you pivot once you've already been kind of like marketing towards this one customer? How would you recommend pivoting to now finding a different pool of people? Does that make sense? Yeah. So is it the same product? You're just realizing that you, you need to hit a different uh, group yes. of people? Yes. Okay. Um, usually, and, and this is a marketing thing, and this is where I live. I'm a marketer and product manager type person. All you need to do, well, first of all, do you know who this new group is, or, or you just know that you need to pivot away from the group you're currently on? Um, so we're, we're pretty much pivoting, we think, to at least making 100000 a year, right? Like having that steady stream so that they can count on like, okay, I can pay my bills, right? I can keep my lights on. I can keep my yeah. shipping going, whatever it is, you know? Um, so it just, it's one of those where we just, we were kind of like small business, right? And now we're having to go like, kind of like this. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Okay. And again, it's, it's the same thing applies where it's the, the more specific you can be, the better, right? The, the way that I like to explain it, and this comes down to like copywriting and, and positioning and, and all that kind of stuff is, you know, it's like a kid trying to put a square peg into a round hole, right? And the thing that's preventing that, the square peg into the round hole is going to be one of two things. Number one, it's going to be the language that you're using. And honestly, that's probably 80% of the time. It's just the language that you're using right? It's the way that you're saying, okay, these are the problems that I'm going to solve. This is how I'm going to solve them. And also using the same words, industry jargon, whatever it is that those people think it, right? Like if you had a magic hat and you could just hear somebody's voice uh, caring about their problems on that company, like you, it would be perfect, right? And that, that's what you need to try to figure out is the language. And then the other 20% of the time where, why that square peg doesn't go into the round hole is going to be product related, right? Um, now let's just assume, and I don't know that much about your product, but let's just assume that there is, there, there might be some friction on that product. Again, been very similar to what I was saying on this presentation. Like I would figure out the language first because the language will tell you the, what you need to change on the product. Okay. Um, and 
yeah, I guess, does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's kind of where we were headed, but I just, it's nice to hear uh, agreement in that. <laughs> yeah. So. And, and having, believe me, pivoting, pivoting customers is, is an easier form of pivoting <laughs> um, because you already, I'm assuming, you know, you're already going to have some testimonials. You're already going to have some statistics that you could use to back to back things up and all of that kind of stuff, right? I mean, basically as a business, you have two options. Either you can, yeah, take the product that you have and reposition it to different business to generate revenue or change the product that you have to uh, generate more business from the people that you already are serving, right? It sounds to me like they can't afford your product, so then you'd have to, to build something that would help them make money probably not your core competency, but, but again, it's like, those are the two options that you have, right? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, anyone else want to, want to jump in? I'm going to share my screen here too. And this is, uh, yeah, I went long on the presentation. I always do. But uh, maybe it's just because of COVID. I like hearing my own voice now. But I'm going to share my screen here just so you guys um, see this. All right. This is a format. And this format, you can also find it on uh, fi.co slash madlibs. But this is, and this is especially for people that are, are trying to come up with, uh, with new products. Okay. Um, half of the time, more than half the time. Whenever you're trying to explain your business, let's say you meet a mentor and, and I know that there's, there's mentor office hours and that kind of stuff going on with, with startup week. Um, you know, you're going to have a limited amount of time, right? And usually how these conversations go is that uh, way too much of that time is, is a communication problem. Just trying to figure out what exactly it is that you're trying to do. And this is a format that we created at Founder Institute to basically help you sort of, we call it uh, Mad Libs, right? You remember the games, kids, I don't know, maybe it's still around now. It's like an iPad app, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, it's Mad Libs. It's like, all right, put in your thing here and then it creates a story, right? Um, and you, we have a whole video and stuff. You can look at it at fi.co slash Mad Libs. But this is how we recommend you try to get your business idea down to. Uh, because number one, it, it follows a lot of the rules I was just saying before, where it just helps you get super, super specific and focused. And number two, again, it allows you anytime you have a conversation with anybody, uh, you know, that you meet on the street or maybe it's somebody that you're trying to recruit, right? It's not just investors or whatever. It could be anybody. Uh, this is a super quick way to make it very, very uh, easy for them to understand what you're doing so then you can actually get some meaningful and useful feedback rather than uh, most conversations that you'll generally see between people sharing their business ideas with other people. Uh, it'll, it'll be 10 minutes of going back and forth just trying to understand what it is that you're doing. Okay. And the way that it works is my company. And again, if you don't have a company name yet, just, just, you can just skip this part, right? You can just say I'm developing. Um, one defined offering. So a defined offering is keep it simple. Okay. It can be an online marketplace. Um, it could be a website, a, a, a mobile app or something like that. Right. Just don't use, there, there's so much jargon out there now. Like I've heard people say like, I'm developing a SAS for, and then, you know, like four other acronyms. And I'm just like, what, what the hell? Um, you know, you just keep it simple because basically you're just trying to put a, a vision in somebody's brain. Okay, it's a website, it's a mobile app, it's whatever. Trying to help one target audience, so as, as I was saying before, try to be specific, right? Um, so if it's nature lovers, for example, uh, you know, it pro you need to be much more specific than that. It's probably, okay, I'm trying to target, um, you know, people uh, in, their, in their mid 20s in the United States, uh, that's that that love to go out and uh, and explore nature and get away from big cities during the weekends right like that that now paints a clearer picture than nature lovers right and honestly I would even as a business you should just start in like Denver right or, or something like that um, solve one problem again just be very specific and then your secret sauce or, or the unique selling proposition unique value proposition key differentiator you know depending on where you 
went to school or what book you read, they'll have a different word for it. But uh, you know, you also want to include that just because that's sort of why you're saying that you can do it and why you can win and, and why your business is, is unique. So uh, anybody on the line? Um, again, I, I know I brought this up a little bit too late, but um, my email, by the way, is um, j at fi.co, okay? Anybody wants to connect with me, additional questions that you didn't think of today, uh, advice, if you wanna, if you wanna share uh, this with me, I'm, I'm happy to look at it. Again, it's, it's, I guess it's technically the second shortest email address in the world. It's just j as in Jonathan, at fi as in founderinstitute.co. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think we have a, another minute or two if anybody else has, uh, has questions here. Okay, uh, I guess I'll take that as a no. <laughs> so um, thanks everyone for joining. Again, don't be shy, j at fi.co, shoot me an email. I'm, uh, I live out here in, uh, in Basalt now and I, I, I travel around Colorado a lot. My wife uh, works in healthcare and she, she travels a decent amount around the, around the Western Slope and also uh, around Boulder and Greeley and uh, other parts of the uh, Eastern state. But uh, yeah, don't be shy, reach out at jfi.co and I hope this was, I hope this was helpful for everybody. <laughs>